Hub Eben was an Israeli diplomat, and back in the 1970s, he said, men and nations behave wisely when they have exhausted all other resources. There's a lot of truth to this. We tend to try everything else except for God's way until everything else fails. And then we say, okay, maybe we, should try, maybe we should try the right way. Here at North Sea, we tend to go back and forth between the Old Testament and the New Testament. This fall, we're coming back to the Old Testament. Over the years, we've gone through Genesis, creation, and the Exodus. We've had Joshua in the time of conquering the Promised Land. And we've gone through the period of the Judges. And we've done King Saul and King David. So we're going to be picking up this season with King Solomon and some of the other kings that follow after David. Well, one of the things we're going to be kind of talking about as a theme throughout these sermons is influence. So today we're talking about Solomon's influence. These, this Sunday and the next two Sundays will focus on Solomon, his influence, uh, his righteousness, but also his downfall. And then we're going to look at some of the other kings after that. We're looking at influence. Because when we look at the idea of, of even having a king in Israel, it came because the people, they couldn't follow God on their own. It was really a mixed bag because the, the people, they came to Samuel and they demanded a king and Samuel was upset. And God says to Samuel, don't be upset, Samuel. They haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. So on the one hand, it seems like God doesn't want them to have a king. On the other hand, in the Torah, in the first five books of the Bible, God already lays out in Deuteronomy stipulations for a king. So God had already planned ahead for this. And the king, it makes a lot of sense because multiple times in Judges, it says that everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And it doesn't seem to say it in a positive way. They didn't do what was right in God's eyes because they reached following God, but they reached doing their own thing. There wasn't, there wasn't order and there wasn't righteousness. And so what we'd had with Moses and Joshua were these great influencers. And I know they were leaders, but I want to use the word influence because we're all called to be influencers. And so there, there they are influencing the people to follow God, but then once Joshua dies and Caleb dies, the people do what's right in their own eyes. And throughout the book of Judges, we see different men, and also Deborah, a woman that God raised up to have influence on the people and to call them back to God. But most of the Judges were more regional, as opposed to a national level, and it was short-lived. It was one problem that had risen up. Much like this quote, people weren't doing what God wanted, and then they get attacked, or something bad happens, God raises up a judge, and they go, okay, we'll do it God's way, and then once things go good again... When the judge has died, the people go back to doing things their own way. And so it becomes this cycle, this process. And so it makes a lot of sense to have a king who could be like a Moses and like a Joshua and lead the people to be godly. The problem is that only works when the leader is godly. And so what we're going to see, not only in the life of Solomon, but then in the lives of other kings, is so many of them weren't. And when they had a godly leader, things went pretty well. When they had an ungodly leader, the people followed after that, and then things went badly. And the question for us today that we want to look at is, how can we be influencers? I mean, we are a royal priesthood. So much like a king who's royal, we're royal because we're children of God. Right? And we're priests. We have a connection directly with God, and so we are called to be influencing this world to do things the right way first, to do things God's way. So how can we be better influencers? At the end of today's sermon, I'm going to give you three practical steps, how you can increase your level of influence. But that's going to be a theme going throughout this series, looking at where they had influence, where they lost influence, what happened, and what does that teach us today. But I want to start back with King David, before we get into the other kings, and start with his last song. These are David's last official words, if you will. He has other words to his family, but this is his last kind of public statement. And it really is, is prophetic about what's going to come after him and the leaders that would come after him. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to open to 2 Samuel 23 and look at the first seven verses. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this text. We thank you for Samuel the prophet, and we thank you for others who recorded the history of the kings and of your people. And God, there's so much that we've... We can learn from them. We pray this morning as we look at Solomon and we, we see the great influence that he exercised. God, may it be an encouragement to us how you can use us. And Solomon wasn't perfect and we're not perfect. But at the same time, God, may it be an encouragement to us to, to walk closer together with you that you might be influencing others through us for the sake of your kingdom. 
which as Solomon did for the earthly kingdom of Israel. God, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So coming to 2 Samuel 23, starting in verse 1. Now these are the last words of David. The oracle of David, the son of Jesse, the oracle of the man who was raised on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel. The Spirit of the Lord speaks by me. His word is on my tongue. The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me. Well, what has God said to him? When one rules justly over men, ruling in the fear of God, he dawns on them like the morning light, like the sun shining forth on a cloudless morning, like rain that makes grass to sprout from the earth. Now this description that David has given of someone who is a positive ruler, he says it's like sun shining forth on a cloudless morning and rain that makes grass, grass sprout. Now notice the sun shining forth in the morning is a gentle sunlight that helps things grow. He knew well in that part of the world there's times when the sun beats down so hard that it scorches the earth. But a good ruler is somebody who's like a gentle sunlight. And then he also compares it to gentle rain. Not hard rain or storms that tear things apart. Not like this incredible tornado that happened in Amsterdam two days ago. It's not that kind of rain. Not the thunderstorms and floods that many of us have experienced in Houston. But rather it's that gentle rain that we seem to get a lot here. Sometimes a little more than we want. But it just it keeps the ground so moist that we get green grass and lush trees. And what David is saying is when you have somebody who's influencing people for God, then it doesn't just help them. It's not just about us. It's not simply about our own holiness, that I'm going to be right with God and the rest of the world be condemned. I don't care what happens to you. But rather, we're the salt of the earth. We're the, the light. of the, I mean, this, this, these illustrations that Jesus uses in the New Testament that David uses here are not just about you. Too many Christians become isolationists. Oh, I don't want to have any part in the world because the world is evil and might corrupt me. The world's going to hell in a handbasket, and I'll just let that happen, and I'll just keep myself holy. Well, we do want to keep ourselves holy and unsoiled by the world, but yet we are supposed to be influencing the world, not the other way around. And so we see that illustrated by Jesus with the salt of the earth and the, the city on a hill. We see it with David here. That we get to be an influence, like a gentle rain, like sunlight, to help growth, to help life happen. Jesus says that the one that believes in him will have springs of living water coming up inside of him and flowing out of him. Again, there's this idea that if we're walking with God, we will have an influence, a blessing to those around us. But then David goes on. For does my, not my house stand so with God? For he has made with me an everlasting covenant. Ordered in all things and secure. For will he not cause to prosper all my help and my desire? And the tone changes here and he says, But worthless men are like thorns that are thrown away. For they cannot be taken with the hand. But the man who touches them arms himself with iron and the shaft of a spear. And they are utterly consumed with fire. So this is the opposite of a positive influence. It's the one that has a negative influence in this world. And you find that people can't even get close to them. Now, if we think about some very obvious examples in our world, leaders like a Kim Jong-un who will kill his own family members to keep power. It's very much like thorns and nobody wants to touch it. Everybody's scared, right? And when we look at North Korea, how many blessings are there? How is that going for them? It doesn't work well. But so many people out of fear are like this. They're so protecting themselves. And we can fall into the same trap. We can have a fear that our job might be threatened by someone more talented, or that our marriage might be threatened by someone else who might be more charming than us, or any other things that start to scare us. And we begin to be so scared that we become like thorns, poking and pushing others away and trying to simply look out for number one. Unfortunately, the way God's designed the earth is there's always systems, systems that work together. We see it in nature, and from nature, from natural laws, we can learn spiritual laws. If this is how God has designed nature to work together, it's how he's designed the spiritual realm as well. It's how Jesus started his church. The Greek word is ekklesia, it's just called out ones. Which, by the way, do you know why that was so threatening to the Romans? 
The word ecclesia, it means the called out ones, but it was usually used to be a governing body. It was those in a city who were called out to vote on things, like the policies, how things would run in the community. So do you see that even in the word ecclesia, we, we use the word church. I almost wish we didn't because church has taken on its own meaning in our heads. And it's a big building with a steeple or it may, whatever it may bring to mind for you. Okay, maybe it brings to mind a, a place in Norway that's only full on Christmas Eve or whatever it is. Or a big beautiful cathedral. And then we spend hundreds of millions of dollars to fix them when they get burned up. But that's not the word Jesus was using. It's not, that's not what it would have brought to mind. When Jesus said, I will build my ecclesia. What would have been brought to mind was, I'm going to build my governing body. Now take that in for a second. Can you imagine why some of the Roman authorities were a little bit got bothered by this? It did sound like he was trying to become an earthly king and overthrow Rome. I'm going to build my governing body. And even the gates of hell won't overcome it. But in that same word, we can see our role. The role that Christ has called us to. Is to be ones who are influencers, who are a governing body, bringing about the will of his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. I want to go back to the first verse here for a second. We can see, though, that in these, these words that he's outlined, we see people like Solomon for the beginning of his reign, and as he is like that gentle sun, that gentle rain, and we see prosperity. We're going to see that in a minute when we look at Solomon. And we can look at other kings later on after Solomon, and we see the destruction that's brought, as they're like thorns. So in a way, what David has said here is, look, I have done what God has asked me. My, he has established my family. And we can see from his words, those that rule after him that are right with God, there will be blessings. And those that don't, there will be curses. But just going back to the first verse, I love this verse, because you may be thinking to yourself, well, that's great, but I'm not royalty. And I understand that. We, many of us don't have, we're not even a politician. And you think, well, what? I don't, I don't have the same influence. But I want you to see something here in the first verse. Because we see what David values most. David introduces himself with a very long title. He could just say, hey, I'm David. I'm King David. Right? It would be quite easy. But it's just one of these long titles that royalty gets used to as they gain titles and, and different positions and things. They get these nice long titles. And typically what happens is they start with the most humble title and they move to the most ex exalted title, if you will. And so he begins and he says, hey, this is the oracle. These are the last words, the statement of David, the son of Jesse. Well, everybody has a, a father. You may not have known your father, but everybody's some kind of a father, and so it's a pretty humble thing. It's, it's like we would just use our last name nowadays, right? I'm David Fresh. This is my statement. That's all he's doing. It's, it's very humble. It doesn't make him stand out from anyone else. But then he goes on, and he says he's the man who was raised on high. Now, now what does that mean? Well, this, I believe, is referring to his military career. He was a military general. So God took him as a shepherd boy and he fought Goliath and suddenly he's raised up on high and people are singing, women are singing songs about him. Saul has killed his thousands, David has killed his tens of thousands. So he goes from being this humble shepherd boy who would fight off a bear and take care of the sheep and even his own dad thought he wasn't worthy of being considered for being king. Right? And yet God takes from that and raises him up and makes him this great general. And general had a lot of esteem and fame. And, and you have to understand, too, they, we still do. We still respect generals. And depending on the culture you're from, they have more or less influence. But especially in this time and other cultures, many of, our, uh, many of the, like the epic poetry that you get is all about great heroes. That was who they celebrated. The Greeks would celebrate the great heroes. And so for David, being this great hero was pretty much the highest level of celebrity. You, there were no movie stars or pop stars. So, I mean, this, this was it. This made him a big deal. But he doesn't stop there. He says, the anointed of the God of Jacob. Now, what was he anointed for? Samuel anointed him to be king. Well, that's even better than being a great general. I mean, great generals up here, but being a king, that's another step. Right? So David is building up about his more and more important roles. And these are roles that he exercised influence. But his last title is his greatest one. He calls himself the sweet psalmist of Israel. Right? He wrote so many songs. He encouraged people to praise God, to worship God. And so this is what he considers his greatest accomplishment. Not being a general or being king, but the fact that he led people in the worship of Yahweh, of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob.
And so I say that to you today to say, you know what, all of us have that opportunity. We may not be in, a, if some of you are in the military, but others are not. We may not be in politics, like ruling, like a king. But all of us have the opportunity to influence people towards the worship of God. And David would say that was his greatest accomplishment, not the other things. And so that's the encouragement now. And unfortunately, many of his successors didn't understand this. And they got lost in their own greed and selfish desires. So now I want to turn over to 1 Kings chapter 4. In 1 Kings uh, chapter 3, we're not going to read it, but this is a, a famous story that many of you are familiar with, where Solomon, God asks Solomon, what do you want? And Solomon asks for wisdom. Now, I would encourage you, because we're going to be going through this book, that you do take time to read 1 Kings 1, 2, 3, and also 4 and 10 today. We're not going to do all of 4 10. Then we're going to come back next week and do some of the in-between chapters. But it'll help give you a better, a better foundation. But I do want to focus on chapter 3 because I know you're more familiar with it. And I really wanted to go ahead and skip ahead. So at this point in chapter 4, Solomon has already had that granting from God of his wisdom. And in verse 20 and 21 we read, Judah and Israel were as many as the sand by the sea. They ate and drank and were happy. Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms from the Euphrates to the land of the Philistines and to the border of Egypt. They brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. So here's Solomon. He's ruling with God's wisdom. First thing we see is that Judah and Israel, so that's the whole kingdom. Later their kingdom is going to become divided. But so the, at this point, Solomon rules over the whole kingdom, and it's actually become so large, it expands under him, that it really is the ideal size that God had promised to Abraham. And so we're seeing this fulfillment. We're also seeing the fulfillment of the promise that God made to Abraham that his descendants would be like sand. Right? Sand next to the sea. There's so many of them. And so we see the fulfillment of prophecy in God's promises. But it goes on and says that they ate and drank and were happy. The point is here, as Solomon ruled in the wisdom of God, it wasn't just a blessing for him. It wasn't just him who was very wealthy and, and was very well taken care of. But all of his people. Things were good. As a matter of fact, in verse 25 we read, And Judah and Israel lived in safety. That was a big deal back then. It still is to us today, but we maybe take it for granted. From Dan even to Beersheba. Every man under his vine and under his fig tree all the days of Solomon. It's speaking of the wealth. Whether every man actually literally had a vine or a fig tree, we, we could debate. But the point is that this is how wealthy they were. There was plenty of wine to go around. There were plenty of figs. These are not the foods you necessarily survive on. right? We need things like wheat or grains just to stay alive. And if you're poor, that's what you're eating. Well, the point is here the land was so blessed. They all had not only the basic needs, but they had luxuries. They had above and beyond. And so we see that God is working through to fulfill his promises to Abraham. And he's also working through Solomon to fulfill the promise of the, the people have been multiplied, the land has been enlarged, and they're being blessed. Now, we talk about his wisdom. We know that he had this godly wisdom. We know the story of the baby and the two prostitutes. But Solomon's wisdom wasn't just about these kind of uh, judgment matters. He had knowledge about all sorts of things. He was really like a scientist in his day. If we read verses 29 here through 34 at the end of this chapter, it says, And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding beyond measure, and breadth of mind like the sand on the seashore, so that Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the people of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. And they come out of Egypt, and now they're surpassing Egypt. For he was wiser than all other men, wiser than Ethan, the Ezrahite, and Heman, Calcol, and Darda, the sons of Mahol. And his fame was in all the surrounding nations. Now we don't necessarily know who these people are today, but obviously the readers would have known these were quite famous, wise teachers of some sort. And he's saying Solomon surpassed all of them. He also spoke 3,000 proverbs. And his songs were 1,005. He spoke of trees from the cedar that is in Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of the wall. He spoke also of beasts and of birds and of reptiles and of fish. And people of all nations came to hear the wisdom of Solomon and from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. Alright, so, so what is it telling us here? It says, 
He had all kinds of, of wisdom and it was very broad. It was all sorts of things, not just about God, but about even earthly things that he was studying, plants and animals. It illustrates this by saying that he would talk about everything from the cedar that is in Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of the wall. Well, the cedars in Lebanon, these are quite famous. It's what he built the temple out of, built his palace out of. But they were considered the largest trees in the world at that time. Okay, for them, that's what they knew as the biggest trees there were. Hyssop that grew out of the wall was like the smallest plant. And so what the, they're saying is he studied everything from the biggest to the smallest. He has an A to Z idea. Okay, every kind of plant he was studying. And then it says he, he studied the beasts and the birds. Again, large things like lions all the way to small things, little birds and songbirds. And then it again illustrates it and says reptiles and even fish that are in the water. So he was very observant. And to the point that people would come to like take classes from him. But it's really quite incredible to think about. And of course most people there were sustenance, farming, and, and, and so it would only be those who were in the courts of kings. But it says kings were sending their people going, I want you to go study under Solomon for a while and then come back and bring all this knowledge. So he was on the cutting edge. Now he would take that knowledge and he wouldn't just describe what he observed, but he would come up with wisdom from it. I said earlier that God has given us the natural world to look at, but it does illustrate for us the spiritual realm. And he did that. If we look, for example, at Proverbs chapter 6. In Proverbs chapter 6, you know this passage, I hope, but starting in verse 6, Solomon says, Go to the ant, O sluggard. Well, what is he doing? He's been studying this tiny little creature. He's been taking time to think and consider what can I learn from it. He says, Go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber, and want like an armed man. Now I'm sure we don't have all the recorded teachings of Solomon in Proverbs, because there's many things he would have taught about. But we have this illustrated here for us. We can see that he was studying little creatures, and then he was from that extrapolating, well, what should we do in our lives? What should we learn from the God's creation? And this was so incredible to the people but there they are wanting to learn everything he had to say. Now we learn a lesson from this. And the lesson that I, I gather from this is God has called you to something in life or some things. And it may be different. For one it's an engineer, for another it may be teaching English, for another it may be music, and it may be multiple things that you feel called to. It may be there's some things in, that you earn money for and some things that are hobbies. But the point is God has gifted you and talented and can give you certain talents. It's like Eric Little, who was a missionary, but he went and he competed in the Olympics, and some people didn't like that because he was taking time away from being a missionary. But he said, when I run, I can feel God smiling down at me. He just knew this is something God made me for. And actually, because of that, his story has become so widely popular, he inspired many, many more missionaries. So the little bit of time he took away from missions was actually an investment and has created far more interest in missions than if he had never done that. The point is that God had made him to run. God has, I guess we can all run, but not all of us feel quite as called to running. But the point is, I don't know what God's called you to. We might think, well, that's not very spiritual. But you look at what Solomon did. Solomon felt called to study God's creation. And, and these things weren't always spiritual. We're talking about the ant and how to not be a sluggard, how to not fall into poverty. But it was through that that he had great influence. And then that respect is transferred to other things. So they come and they respect him. Do you think they also had interest in who his God was? Do you think when they saw how much wisdom he had, and they said, how do you have so much wisdom? And he said, well, my God came to me and offered, it, offered me whatever I wanted. And I asked for wisdom. Ooh, <laughs> I want to know who this God is. And they, look at the wealth he has. Look at the nation, how well it's doing. So you see, it was a testimony. And so in our own lives, we don't always think that everything we're doing could be an influence for God. But yet in the New Testament, we're told what? 1 Corinthians 10.31, do all things for the glory of God. I think, how do we bring glory to God when I'm, you know, fixing a broken uh, door or something? But yet as we do things excellently, it provides us with the influence of people and they find there's respect in that. And if we build respect in those things, then they're going to be listening to other things we have to say. And they'll hear the spiritual things we have to say. 
And you can imagine if you met someone whose life is a complete mess and they were, everything was falling apart. I, I've, I've met some actually, because I used to work in drug counseling, as you know. There are a lot of drug addicts, and man, they had a lot of wisdom to share. They had all the answers. I took a lot of it with like handfuls of salt. Because I looked at how their lives were going. And they would tell me they'd figured this out or that out or they'd read some Eastern teaching. And you kind of go, well, I'm, I'm not going to take it from you. It's why if, if, if I'm flipping channels or nowadays flipping YouTube videos and seeing what's on, if I see somebody like Bill Gates speaking, I go, oh, I want to hear what he has to say because he's, he's done a lot of, he's had a lot of accomplishments. If I see somebody I've never heard of and they say they have all the answers, I just kind of skip it because there's... Everybody, anybody could say that. So my point is, as we are able, like Solomon, then we don't have to know everything. We don't have to be great at everything. The point is, whatever God has made you for, whatever you feel that God finds joy when you involve yourself in it, do it your best. And that will help you to have influence with people and allow you to also share the gospel and share life with them in such a way to influence them for the kingdom. If we go on from this, we're going to skip over to chapter 10. Solomon's wisdom spreads, kings are sending their people, but then a queen comes. The queen of Sheba herself comes to sit at Solomon's feet. Now there may have been a political reason for this, and I'll explain that in a minute. But this is 1 Kings 10, we're going to read verses 1 through 13. Now when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions. I love people like that. Not to learn from him, but I'm going to check this out. She's skeptical. We'll see. She came to Jerusalem with a very great retinue, with camels bearing spices and very much gold and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she told him all that was on her mind. And Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing hidden from the king that he could not explain to her. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food of his table, the seating of his officials, and the attendance of his servants, their clothing, his cupbearers, and his burnt offerings that he offered at the house of the Lord, there was no more breath in her. It took her breath away. She was stunned. She was amazed. She had nothing to say. And she said to the king, The report was true that I heard in my own land of your words and of your wisdom. But I did not believe the reports until I came and my own eyes had seen it. And behold, the half was not told me. Your wisdom and prosperity surpassed the report that I heard. Happy are your men. Happy are your servants who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God who has delighted in you and set you on the throne of Israel. Because the Lord loved Israel forever, he has made you king, that you may execute justice and righteousness. Then she gave the king 120 talents of gold and a very great quantity of spices and precious stones. Never again came such an abundance of spices as these that the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. Moreover, the fleet of Hiram, which brought gold from Ophir, brought from Ophir a very great amount of almug wood and precious stones. And the king made of the almug wood supports for the house of the Lord and for the king's house, and lyre, also lyres and harps for the singers. No, no such almug wood has come or been seen to this day. So Solomon here. Oh, I'm sorry, there's one more verse. And King Solomon gave to the Queen of Sheba all that she desired. Whatever she asked besides what was given her by the bounty of King Solomon. So she turned and went back to her own land with her servants. So the Queen of Sheba shows up. She has 120 talents of gold here. Now you might be wondering why that much. Now by the way, if you're wondering how much is that, it comes out to 9,000 pounds or in kilos over 4,000 kilos of gold. So it's not a small gift. Although if you read further down you find out that the, the average gold that he would get in a year was 666 talents. So it was a small thing compared to the wealth that Solomon had. Why was it 120? This is kind of a trivial thing, but I think it's interesting if we go back to chapter 9, verse 14, we find that Hiram had sent to the king 120 talents of gold. My guess is she had heard about this gift and did not want to be shown up and thought, okay, if that's a proper gift, I'm going to bring that kind of a gift to King Solomon. Now, at the same time, it's interesting because Hiram had actually already outdone himself in verse 28 of chapter 9 and brought 420 talents. 
But I'm guessing she'd heard the first number and somehow that had gotten to her. Hey, this was a gift that was given. She wanted to make sure she brought a worthy gift. Now she comes from Sheba. Sheba, we believe, is where modern day Yemen is. There they are down there. She's made her way up. The reason this would have been an important visit, that many scholars at least theorize, is that she may have been there to negotiate a trade deal. The people living there were called the Sabians. So she was the queen over the Sabians. And they had sea trade with both India and over to Africa. And they pretty much were monopolizing trade at that time, especially the trade of spices. And we see that mentioned here in the text, that they'd never had so many spices come in at once, and never again had that kind of a load of spices come in. But Solomon's trade was expanding and expanding to the point that he had ships who would go, that would go out and go out for three years. That's how far they would go, and they would bring back apes, they would bring back all kinds of treasure. And so it probably was starting to threaten the Sabians. Now, of course, there was no Suez Canal here. So these ships here from Israel would have to go around all the way down and over for any kind of trade. But as it's expanding and expanding, there's a theory that it may have started to threaten the Sabians. They thought, wait a minute. How about we go make a deal with them that we'll do all the trading farther than this and we'll bring it to them and give them a good deal. And there's actually been a stamp it has been found in the 9th century BC, and it was found in Israel, but it has a southern Arabic script made of a reddish-brown clay that is found in Yemen. And so there's thought that this stamp lends credence to this theory that they had some kind of a trade deal they were working out. So there she comes, and she's cynical or doubtful. Is this guy really as wise as they say he is? But she sits there and she learns from him and she's so impressed by his wisdom. But she's also impressed by something else. Verse 8, we read a second ago. Happy are your men. Happy are your servants who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. You see, it didn't just make an impression what she was being taught. It wasn't just the words. It was, in a way, it's kind of the action side of it, right? It's one thing what we say, but what do we do? His servants weren't there and, and, and suffering, which would have made her go, well, I'm not sure about this wisdom. But rather, she's going, well, this is a joyful place. Everybody seems to be really happy to have him as their king. Well, what queen doesn't want your subjects, especially those that are your cupbearers that serve you wine and food that could poison you, you want them to like you. And she goes, hey, this... This applies to me. I need to do whatever he's doing because it's going to make things better in my court and for my people. And so what does that lead to then? She says in verse 9, Blessed be the Lord your God. It's a testimony straight to God. So again, we see that that, that influence that he's having, the, the fruitfulness of his life that she sees, leads her then to give glory to his God. I'm sure that's also because Solomon was giving credit to God that he had given him the wisdom. And so this teaches us another lesson which is that we need to truly care about others. We want to exercise influence. That Solomon seems to have cared about his people. He could have made them, he, he didn't have to bless them as nicely as he did and dress them in such fine clothing, but he wanted the blessings to spread out from him. And so it seems that he, he truly cared about them. People can tell your motives. People, we can sense people that really care about us, that they're just trying to use us. But as Christians, we're called to really love our neighbor and even love our enemy. And that means we're supposed to care about what's best for them. You know, the good Samaritan who hurts his enemy, who's there on the ground, who's beaten up. If we really care about people, it's going to increase the influence we have for the kingdom. You know, Jesus did what he did, not simply out of duty, but out of love. People could sense the love that Christ brought. The woman who's about to be stoned for adultery could sense Christ's love. The Pharisees, they knew the Bible, the Old Testament that is, but there was no love there. They were called whitewashed tombs by John the Baptist because they looked clean, they looked holy, but it was like the, I was talking about earlier, they were all folks in their own holiness and the world can go to hell for all we care. Let everybody else be condemned, I'm going to be right with God. And what John the Baptist is saying is you can't be right with God if you're only focused on yourself. If you don't care about anybody else. The Pharisees were happy to stone people and they thought, I'm doing God's bidding. I'm going to clean this place up and eliminate all the sinners. And Jesus said, okay, well then whoever has no sin, go ahead and throw the first stone if we're going to eliminate all the sinners. They didn't literally say that, but that was the idea, right? And what happened? They started to drop their stones and walk away because when they really started to have some introspection. We're all sinners. 
We've all fallen short of the glory of God, as Romans 3.23 says. And so, if we truly love and care about others, care about what's best for them, not just what we can get out of them, not how we can use them, or not simply about making our point, or showing that we're right, or showing that we're smarter than them, or all these other temptations that we may have, we go, I really want what's best for my neighbor, for my colleague, for my spouse, for my kids. People can tell the difference. The third, and we'll go over these again in one second here on our last slide, but the third thing we see from this, if we want to have great influence, is the ability to dialogue. When the Queen of Sheba came to Solomon, it says she had prepared questions for him. Right? Hard questions. Now very often as Christians, when people begin to threaten us, or threaten our faith, or even threaten us in other ways at work, we begin to get defensive. We want to prove ourselves. We may get afraid. We may feel like we don't have the answers. We might run away from the conversation. We might become combative. We see this so much in internet culture and comments when people begin to get into a discussion and they start calling names of each other. They start to put each other down, start attacking one another. When that happens, it means you've, you've lost the argument already. Ravi Zacharias likes to say that you can't cut off somebody's nose and then offer them a rose that smells sweet for them to enjoy. And this is what too often we do as Christians. We become so combative. We want to prove ourselves that in the end, then people don't want to hear the sweet things of the gospel. Now, this connects very nicely with if we really care about people, we can have better dialogue. So just to review here as we close, just three ways to help increase our influence. Number one, do everything to the glory of God. If people respect you in one area, it will transfer to others. So if they find respect for you, whether it's at work or in a hobby or just your neighbors, they will begin to wonder about other things in your life and respect even the spiritual things you have to say. Number two, truly care about others. People sense your motives. Okay, if they feel like you're... This is so often the problem we've heard about is if people feel like they're just... A, that they're the, the goal, they're just trying to get them to agree with you so that you can go back and feel good about yourself, they get that sense. So people, the people can tell. We should care about people genuinely, not simply to convert them or not to get them to see our side, but just because God loves them. And so we should love them. That will increase your influence. Rick Warren likes to say that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. It's a very simple way to remember it. And then thirdly, dialogue. Learn to dialogue. Now this comes with confidence. Because when we don't have confidence, we get afraid. We become thorny. We become, we become combative. So the question is, where does your confidence come from? See, if I'm having a discussion with somebody who doesn't agree with me about God, I realize it's, it's really not my job to convert them. It's my job simply to throw seeds out there. It's God's job to work in their life. And it's not my job to defend God. I mean, I, I do defend as in defending the, the truth of God. But ultimately, if they're attacking God or, or, or don't agree with me, that's between them and God. He, he can handle it. And so if we have that kind of confidence, but too often we get confidence by other people agreeing with us. We want people around us. This is, this is a, a, just part of our sin nature. We want people that agree, that the yes men, those who always say things that encourage us and tell us how great we are. Most of us don't like criticism. We need it, but we don't like it. And so, in the same way here, we need to have such confidence in Christ that we can dialogue without becoming offended or defensive. The music team is going to come back up here in a second when I pray, and we're going to have a time of a song of response. I just encourage you to think about these three areas and think about your own influence. And just between you and God, ask, is there an area, one of these, that perhaps God wants you to grow in, this week even, to focus on? Either can you do things in a way that is more glorifying to God, or can you show more care for people and be more genuinely caring for them? Is there maybe some selfishness in your heart, or greed, or, or, or uh, yeah, self-focus? Or lastly, is God wanting you to dialogue, to be able to have positive and healthy discussions? Let's pray as the team comes up. God, we thank you so much for the truth of Solomon, for the wisdom that we can still gain from today 3,000 years later. And God, I just pray that you would help each of us to know and to be capable of what you've called us to do as your royal priesthood, as your influencers, God. God, I pray that this church as a community, that we would be influencers together in this city, 
in this country and around the world. But I also pray for each individual here today, God. I pray that you would work in their hearts by the power of your Spirit to help them have the greatest influence in their areas of influence, in their families, in their workplace, in their neighborhoods, God. God, I pray that you would give them wisdom as you gave to Solomon. In the book of James, you say, if we pray for wisdom with faith, you will give it to us. And so God, I pray for wisdom for each of us that's here today, God, that we would be able to know how to best be an influence for the sake of your kingdom to the world around us. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.